A reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, and chapter 16, verses 4b through 15. Listen for a good word from the Lord. Jesus said to them, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from my Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are testifying because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So it was Sunday morning, and Lucy Lynn was where she always was on Sunday morning. She was in church. But this was no ordinary Sunday morning. This was a truly special day for young Lucy Lynn, because this was the day on which she was to be confirmed and welcomed into the full membership of her own Episcopal Church. And though she was young, she knew that this was an important day in her spiritual journey. And as the worship service progressed, she kept waiting for some clear and visible sign of God's Spirit being placed upon her. That's how the Bible tells us the Spirit of God reveals itself after all, isn't it? When Jesus was baptized, we are told that the heavens were opened up and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. Then the Gospel of Matthew records the audible voice of God saying, This is my Son, whom I love, and in whom I am well pleased. In the Pentecost reading that was read and is always celebrated on this day, it, it tells of a rushing wind and tongues of fire that are sent as signs of God's power being bestowed upon the church. And so with these stories in her mind, young Lucy Lynn walked down the aisle of that sanctuary at the point of her confirmation. And she waited for a sign. As the bishop spoke the words of confirmation, where he said, Defend, O Lord, this your child with your heavenly grace. She looked up to the heavens and waited. And she waited and waited and waited. And yet no outward sign signifying the work of the Holy Spirit could be found. No descending dove, no voice from God, no wind or fire. Dr. Lucy Lynn Hogan is now a professor of preaching and worship at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. And when she tells this story, she says that at the completion of the ritual, she rejoined her beaming parents in their normal pew. She was now fully confirmed as a member of the Episcopal Church. And she says that she still felt like the same old Lucy. Now, how many of us could tell our own version of that story? As we walk the aisle of, say, this sanctuary or some other sanctuary like it, asking God to come into our hearts and to transform us into a new creation, or maybe as we emerge soaking wet from the cleansing baptismal waters, how many of us in that moment looked to the heavens, waiting, perhaps desperately, for a sign? We wanted some confirmation from God that God was pleased by what we had done and that God was blessing us. Or perhaps it was in a moment of desperation or even tragedy when your life seemed too dismal. You were so low that you could not see any way out and you prayed in that moment that God would just send forth the Holy Spirit as a sign of God's power and might and control. And yet it appeared, at least, 
that no sign came. Where was God, we asked? Where was the Holy Spirit? I mean, the Bible describes signs and wonders that proclaim the coming of God's Holy Spirit. And yet, Lucy Lynn Hogan, and perhaps for us, it might be that no such visible sign could be found, at least not in the moment. And yet, Dr. Hogan says that she still knows that she was changed that day. While she found herself standing with the disciple Philip in John 14, asking, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. She also remembered Christ's response to him in words after. Haven't I been with you this entire time? Haven't you seen me? Didn't you know that I'm in my Father and the Father's in me? She remembered that because she was walking with Christ and doing what he commanded, she had received the Holy Spirit and was indeed changed because she was filled, filled with love, peace, passion, and a purpose that could only come from God. In a way, she was herself now the sign of God's Spirit at work in the world. She would be able to testify now to what God had done in her life and what God was still doing, and people would hear. And many of you, if I asked, could come testify to that fact as well. Though you did not receive tongues of fire, and though the Spirit did not descend upon you like a dove, you can still point back to that day when you cried out for God's Spirit. You opened yourself up to God's presence, unlocking a door that may have been unlocked for as long as you can remember, and you were indeed changed. You were healed. You were encouraged. You were lifted up. You were given the gift of the Holy Spirit at work. And you can testify to its power. You have felt God's presence when you had been isolated and alone. You've heard the voice of God claiming you when it felt like everyone else around you was dismissing you and putting you down. You have found strength to endure great hardship from a source beyond yourself. You've found an unexplainable peace in the midst of your life's storms or direction when you felt lost. You had someone to walk beside you on this journey, even if you couldn't see him. And that's your story. It's your testimony. And it needs to be shared. I don't know about you, but I have never seen tongues of fire or even a rushing wind that specifically declared the Lord's presence. But I still believe that I have seen the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and in the world. You know, I don't even know if God continues to work in that same way as the disciples experienced on Pentecost. But I do believe with all my heart that we can all see the Holy Spirit's work if we simply open our eyes and know where to look for it. Jesus told the disciples that the sign for which they so desperately searched had really been with them all along. As impressive as Jesus' miracles were, apparently that didn't seem like enough at the time for them. But that is how the Spirit has worked throughout all of world history. Sometimes it's God's creative force speaking the world into creation, or liberating people from captivity, or raising Christ from the dead and exalting him at the right hand of God at the ascension. But for every time in between, it's a still and maybe small, unassuming, but unwavering presence that we're given. Jesus had been with them, and though he wouldn't be with them any longer, he promised to send them another advocate, one who would keep doing for them what he had already done, but on an even greater scale. The spirit he would send would point them toward the same place as Jesus had, and that same spirit would be at work in anyone in the world throughout history who had faith in him. And still at work today in you and me. He said the Spirit would teach the world about sin in the same ways that he did. It would be the tug on their hearts that enables them to know when they are giving themselves over to something that is drawing them or drawing the world away from God instead of embracing something that would draw us all to God. It would cry out to them that they were putting their faith in something besides God, making an idol out of something. It would help them name the things that we do and consume that lead to death instead of abundant life, enslavement of ourselves and others instead of liberation for all. It would hold up the mirror and reveal their hypocrisy and our hypocrisy. Because for people of faith these days, for you and for me, it confronts us with the fact that we may say we believe Jesus with our mouths and do nothing with our lives to back it up. 
And that's troubling. Because we are meant to be the signs that the world needs to see in order to understand the ways of righteousness. They can't see Jesus any longer. But they can see us. We are meant to be the ones who help them see with our lives that the brokenness in this world, the sickness, destruction, poverty, brutality, violence, hunger, greed, consumerism, and everything else will not have the final say. They will know by the fruits of our lives and the fruits of our labors that peace, justice, healing, transformation, and care are on the winning side because of the power of Christ's love at work in the world. And that is what's turning the world right side up. What if, just like with the disciples, the signs we are looking for are all around us? And even more than that, what if the signs we are looking for are already within us? We just need to look inside, acknowledge them, and testify to them with the way that we live so that we can be the signs that the world needs. Those are the testimonies that have moved me the most throughout my life, and those are the signs that I have needed. I'm sure you have as well. We may have never seen the Lord work through rushing wind and fire, but we have all seen lives transformed. Situations completely changed because someone saw fit to treat another person with dignity and with love in spite of a condition, a mistake, or a way of life that the rest of the world shunned. On many occasions, we have seen people of all faiths and all backgrounds, all ideologies and political parties come together for good in the wake of tragedy, overcoming everything we use to divide us today. And we have seen people put down their own concerns and embrace the needs of others with compassion putting someone else's needs before their own. And I believe that in these moments, if you look closely enough, you see the Holy Spirit at work around us through children and teenagers and adults of all ages, through teachers and caregivers, and through every good neighbor out there. The Spirit is at work everywhere, uniting all people in the cause of Christ for the good of the world. All we have to do is open our eyes and pay attention. And when we see it, we should champion that story and share it for the world to see. Life and the world are not always filled with the things that we see in Christ or the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You know, those things of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest of that list. But the world desperately needs those things. I'd say longs for them even. And maybe that's why last year, in the midst of the pandemic, people latched on to John Krasinski starting to share his parody news program that he called Some Good News on YouTube and social media. The mission of that entire project was to do nothing but point out the good news in a time when our news feeds were full of anything but good news. He shared every story he could find of people doing incredible, kind, and charitable things. He brought out moments of joy in a truly bleak time. He pointed to sign after sign of goodness at work in the world in ways that prove to counteract what we normally find that has left us cynical and at times feeling hopeless. The Holy Spirit came upon the church so that people of faith would know that we are never alone and that things are never hopeless. But Jesus did not leave us orphaned. We have the Holy Spirit with us. It is binding displaced people together even now. It is pointing us toward the things of Christ. It is holding us accountable and calling us back to our truest selves in God. It is also meant for so much more than simply our own benefit. It is meant to help us live lives that testify to God's work in the world. There was a time when Ignatius of Loyola once sent people on mission with these words, Go set the world on fire and in flame. And his point was to send forth those who would spark a deep passion for God in the world, and this is our moment to do it. In a world full of challenges, that is what we are called to do. Those who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit will come up with innovative solutions to the world's biggest problems. They will cure diseases not yet curable. They will find ways to end hunger and rescue the poor. They will find diplomatic solutions to keep warring nations from blowing each other off of the face of the planet. They will work to stop the cycle of violence and racism and sexism that plagues our communities. And even if they never do anything that large, 
God will use people of faith with the indwelling of the Spirit. Indeed, God will use us all to be part of God's work to redeem the world through each small act of kindness and love that testifies to the fact that the risen Christ is still alive and at work in the world. Yes, these continue to be strange and difficult times for the church, for all of us throughout this world. Perhaps as we continue to reflect on Pentecost and reflect upon the work of God in the world, we can look at this now, today, as an opportunity to make sure that we are living out our mission to testify to God in the world. And if we pray for God to give us an injection of Christ's Spirit again in the ways that we need at this time, I believe we will gain the revitalization we so desperately seek, and we will give the testimony that the world so desperately needs. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a word to speak, a word in the midst of brokenness and tragedy of the world, a word of good news and hope that is unlike anything else. We may not feel a rushing wind, we may not see tongues of fire, but I still believe that God's Holy Spirit could come even to the smallest of groups in the smallest of ways and give us a word to speak that the world needs to hear, a testimony to the work of God in our lives and throughout the world. At some point, we have probably all asked for a sign of God's presence. You know, these days, my prayer is that others would see the sign that they're looking for in us. So as you embark on the next step in your journey, whatever that may be, as you eagerly anticipate what will happen next and what God will do in the next part of your life, Remember that even though God may not make a great show of the Holy Spirit at work, it has indeed been working through each one of you every day. So go and set the world on fire and in flame. Find ways to be open to the Holy Spirit's direction and discover those passions that will form your life's true purpose and calling and work. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would be upon you as you go and that it would be upon us all as together we strive to testify to the world of the power of God at work each day. Amen.